The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Very good afternoon to all. Uh, apologies for a couple of minutes delay. Uh, technology, COVID times, trying to work out a new mode. Uh, but I guess it's working well, except that uh, we've not been able to get Sanjeev on the webcam yet. So while we are talking, uh, I'm sure uh, you know we're trying to rectify that portion as well. So once again, uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of Care Ratings, I welcome you all to this webinar on impact of COVID-19 on the renewable sector current perspectives. My name is Swati Agrawal, and I'm a senior director and co-national head for Care Ratings. As we all know, COVID-19 has led to fever disruptions. Its impact has reverberated on all sectors, albeit in varying degrees. Renewable energy sector is no exception, with industrial consumption at almost negligible levels, commercial consumption waning, discount collections getting impacted, funding sources and supply chains getting disrupted. Needless to say that all these have impacted the sector's cash flows. However, there are silver linings too, in the form of announcement of must-run status of these plants, thereby being accorded preference in optics and to some extent payouts. To deliberate more on this, we have today here an ensemble of industry stalwarts who will be sharing with us their views on the ground reality. On behalf of Care Ratings, I extend a very warm welcome to all our esteemed panelists. Before we move to the introduction of the panelists, I would like to introduce our Indian CEO, Mr. Ajay Mahajan, who took charge recently on April 15, 2020. Mr. Mahajan is a widely experienced banker with 30 years of experience. He worked in organizations like Bank of America, where he started his career in 1990 to become MD and country head of Global Markets Group. Thereafter, he worked in various entrepreneurial assignments, including being a part of the management team at inception of ES Bank in 2004, building UBS's maiden branch in India in 2008, and then working in a hugely transformative role in IDFC, which converted from being an infrastructure financing NBFC to full service commercial bank. We now welcome our first panelist, Ms. Pratibha Bajaj. Ms. Bajaj is an investment officer at IFC. She has more than 14 years of experience in financing companies in renewables, transport, and logistics sector. I'm sure a lot of you identify with her. At IFC, she focuses on debt and equity investments in renewables. Pratibha has a BTEC in IIT, sorry, from IIT Bombay and an MBA from Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. IFC, as we all know, is a member of the World Bank Group and is the largest global development institution focused on private sector in the emerging markets. We now welcome our next panelist, Mr. Ranjit Gupta, CEO of Azure Power. Ranjit has extensive experience in renewable energy, thermal, power and oil and gas industry, with specialities in project management, business development, bidding and project finance. Prior to Azure Power, Ranjit co-founded and served as the Chief Executive Officer of Austro Energy, where he spearheaded growth to build a 1100 megawatt renewables platform. Prior to Austro, Ranjit co-founded Orange Renewable and has also served as founding CEO of India Boards Power. We now welcome our next panelist, Mr. Sanjeev Agrawal, MD and CEO of Amplus Solar. We still haven't got Sanjeev back on the screen, is it? Okay. Sanjeev is the founder and CEO of Amplus Energy Solutions, one of Asia's largest distributor, distributed solar company. His vision of providing low carbon energy solutions has enabled Amplus to create a name in the distributed solar industry and to scale up from a 100 kilowatt in 2014 to over 650 megawatt of rooftop and open access solar projects, spread over more than 300 sites, catering to more than 200 commercial and industrial customers in a five-year time period is quite an Amplus is a member of Petronas of Malaysia and is the renewable energy platform of this Fortune 200 oil and gas company. From Care Ratings, we also have Kunal Arora, our sector specialist, who will be making a presentation on Kunal's perspective, or on Kay's perspective on COVID impact. Uh, before we move, into, move forward, let me just remind our viewers here, uh, may I request them all to type your questions and answers, uh, questions um, and send them across because we will have a Q&A session after the panel discussion. May I now call upon Ajay to present his opening remarks, please. 
<clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Swati. I, I want to welcome um, uh, all uh, all the audience uh, to this um, seminar by CARE. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and most importantly, thanking the panel as well um, for for sparing the time. Um, with that, um, I just want to uh, keep my comments brief. Uh, we have uh, uh, sort of experts from the renewable energy industry, so I would uh, hand over to them to give their expert comments. But before that, just a, a five to ten minute um, sort of uh, uh, opening remarks by me. Um, first and foremost, um, let's all be very clear. This is probably the one of one of the most disruptive events that has probably um, th this generation of ours collectively will will probably see in their lifetimes. Um, it, there is uh, the GFC crisis, and the fallout of that, to my mind, pales in front of the negative impact to the economy and businesses uh, and of course to human life uh, that uh, coronavirus has uh, is likely to cause um, let's spend a minute on pre covid conditions you know um, it's easy to blame a, a, <clears throat> the covid 19 for everything that the world will go through but let's also spend a minute minute on on where the world was prior to covid 19 the world was near zero and perhaps in many countries negative interest rates the world had seen global risk appetite at its peak and repeatedly despite warnings from several experts on wall street uh, the uh, equity markets kept climbing up and up and only up on february 8th or 10th dow jones was at 30000 index right so so uh, the the point simply is the world had had gotten used to a absolutely near zero interest rates so any risk taken could generate value against 0% cost of financing right and on top of that the world was used to chasing higher yields and uh, was disregarding the inherent uh, sort of risks involved in in those investments so a lot of illiquid risk was being bought uh, junk bond market saw yields much tighter than five percent also in the united states and now we are at a situation and of course the unemployment rate was at an all-time low of three and a half percent or below and now we are shooting beyond 10 percent expected to be at 15 20 percent um, uh, only only time will tell as the lockdown in, in case it extends will cause more unemployment i'm commenting very quickly on global risk uh, where it was and it was very easy now to blame that corona has caused this to my mind corona is a trigger and um, it can't necessarily be blamed for all risk aversion that you see across the globe at this moment of time anyhow um, here we are in three months time from february 10 peak of dow we are staring at subsidies we are staring at bailouts we are staring at unemployment benefits we are staring at um, the literally collapse of complete economic sentiment and uh, us gdp is likely to uh, to probably be down 30 to 40 percent in q2 and we expect um, if the lockdown persists these numbers can worsen from here now let's talk about india uh, quickly where are we um uh, actually the data that came out of uh, uh, on the uh, new cases new positive cases is not um, looking good at all last one week data has worsened for india we are at uh, a doubling rate at 5.9 days uh, today positive cases are climbing we did about 3500 cases a day now averaging up more than 2500 last week per day um, commenting on the economy three-fourths of the economy is shut uh, there is um, huge demand destruction healthcare spend in india is always very low and as a result, the uh, healthcare systems is bursting at its uh, as it at its seams uh, to help and provide uh, all kinds of uh, care to uh, positive patients. Um, business incomes have obviously dropped. There's inability to service past debt. Um, fresh credit is going to be hard to come. So it's like a double whammy. Uh, you don't your revenues have stopped completely or near completely. Uh, incomes therefore are dropping, and you have probably inability to borrow going forward at least uh, in the immediate future. Uh, flight to safety in capital markets is, uh, is uh, well known. Everybody knows that Franklin Templeton closed down their credit funds, impacting 30,000 crores of flow, uh, not coming back into the market. Not that India has very well developed capital markets to raise debt. We will talk about that as we get deeper into infrastructure debt financing discussion further on the panel. So considering that our capital markets still are restricted, largely to double AA A minus double AA uh, upwards uh, credits, and also see massive illiquidity uh, issues around them. Yeah, at a time like this, uh, capital markets will not be a savior 
for most institutions going forward. Only the best of the best, the creme de la creme, will have access to that market for a while. Liquidity support to banks has been good. Reserve Bank of India has, um, has, has, has helped sentiment by putting more and more money on the table, uh, both in terms of direct OMOs, uh, open market operations, as well as uh, TLTROs, which are targeted towards specific sector assets. However, um, not all the TLTROs have been very successful. The last one I, I read about a few days ago was the NBFC sector, where less than half the amount was actually picked up. As a result, risk aversion is at its peak. More than 8 lakh crores of cash is going back to Reserve Bank of India on a daily basis. So banks are flush with liquidity. No one can comment on liquidity. That liquidity is adverse. RBI has taken good care of that. The issue really is where is risk sentiment? Who is going to buy? The, uh, there is no issue around liquidity, at least in the broader systemic liquidity sense. Liquidity to a few sectors is obviously curtailed. To my mind, that curtailment is largely a function of um, lack of risk appetite with the intermediaries, and therefore the argument that should there be a relief package, how much should be the relief package? It is our view that the relief package has to be strong enough. It needs to be in the region of at least 5% of GDP, almost bordering 10 lakh crores, uh, because the requirement of uh, relief will be from uh, not only the poor, not only the MSME sector, but also from the corporate sector at large. And um, there will be uh, substantial um, guarantee support that may be required from the government to ensure that the economy doesn't get into a log jam and there is ability for businesses to continue. That business's ability to continue will come only when risk appetite comes back and risk appetite will come back when markets have confidence. Today, the markets don't have any confidence. Government has to step in to impart that confidence to markets. Uh, so that's roughly about the, about the backdrop. I've taken about maybe five minutes on that. I'll quickly get to the matter at hand. We are here with renewable energy experts. I just want to make some very brief comments on that. India's re renewable energy plan, as we all know, is 175 gigawatt by 2022, approximately 40% of power coming from renewable energy. Clean and green uh, energy is obviously the emphasis across the world um, as there is um, a, a higher and higher objectives uh, across governments to reduce carbon footprint uh, across, uh, ac across um, the, the world. Um, now, post incidence of coronavirus, we see the power demand seems to have significantly dropped. That's obviously not a surprise as most industry and businesses I recently, uh, I just now commented upon, are probably shut. Only very essential services are on uh, and most of them are in agriculture or food products related. So demand for power obviously is dropped. We believe it's at around 50, 55% of capacity. We'll let our experts do the talking whether our numbers are correct or not. Um, there is a, a obviously expected sharp fall in power demand to continue. Some state discoms, Madhya Pradesh, Telangana, Punjab, um, uh, have and Uttar Pradesh have invoked force majeure in their power purchase agreements. Um, so they are citing um, COVID-19 as a disaster event under which they are under no offtake obligations uh, from electricity uh, generators. And therefore, demand from, in, from industry or rather dues from, in, uh, from, from these discoms are continuing to go up and that's not good because that will only stretch the balance sheets and more importantly the working capital requirements of uh, of power generators at a time when uh, <clears throat> the consumption is uh, already taking a hit the mnre has already asked for must run status which is good government of india has, has stepped in and is saying that there should be must run status for power solar plants and wind power plants uh, and they should not be curtailed the, the demand and offtake should not be curtailed for want uh, for uh, any other reason than for grid safety purposes. The time extension uh, is also been provided for under construction projects to make sure that they don't uh, unnecessarily get the raw end of the stick um, due to these um, um, force majeure conditions. The uh, story so far has been very, uh, very rem remarkable. Uh, you know, we started with uh, much lower capacity. We have moved up to 24, 25% of total power capacity in renewable energy. And I think if this disruptive event didn't happen, we could have been well home at our 40% target by 2022. But for now, there are sector specific issues. There are issues relating to risk aversion. I talked about the issues relating to the fact that the <clears throat> Indian banking industry 
is uh, facing a very difficult time. It all started with ILFS, I would think, three years ago, post the infrastructure and PA uh, uh, accretions, uh, and then with ILFS and then DHFL and multiple other sort of failures of, uh, uh, of, of um, <clears throat> the uh, businesses and perhaps uh, a large mounting of NPAs, the risk aversion towards infrastructure sector anyway uh, was quite high. More NBFCs were palatably looking at infra risks as opposed to banks due to ALM issues as well. And now wind sector had, uh, and, 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 and basically, um, we will talk about this a bit more uh, later, but basically at this moment of time, the sources of funding towards this sector look very challenged. Um, having said this, there is huge institutional investor demand uh, for, for operating assets in India, as you have seen, several sovereign wealth funds have stepped in, pension funds have stepped in, and the, their bouquet of investments and business uh, businesses they own in India is continuing to grow quite rapidly. So that is frankly providing uh, a silver lining in this uh, somewhat dark cloud that we are seeing today. With that, I would just say that Care Ratings enjoys a fairly formidable position in this in this sector. We have very consciously built relationships uh, under Swati and her team, and also at uh, in other geographies um, um, in in this particular area. And uh, we 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 believe that we have a reasonably good understanding of this sector. With this, I just hand over to my colleague Kunal, who will uh, take us through a short presentation of how. Care rating sees this sector at this moment of time. Thank you, and uh, I hand over to Kunal. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful uh, address uh, to kickstart the event. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants who have taken out time from the busy schedule to attend the webinar. Uh, I'll take you through this presentation. Uh, uh, this is just a brief of what we'll be covering during this presentation. Uh, this is basically two part presentation. In the first part, I'll be covering brief about the sector, uh, key numbers and what has been happening in the last two months. And the second part of the presentation would basically cover what has been the impact of COVID-19 on the renewable energy sector so far? This is just a brief slide uh, giving a brief overview of the power sector. Uh, what has been the numbers as uh, Ajay sir just mentioned that we are at around 24% of the total installed capacity in terms of renewable and solar and wind are almost at an equal percentage in terms of renewable mix. In terms of capacity additions, uh, I'll take a few seconds here. Uh, as we can see in the last two to three years, there have been a significant dip in the capacity additions. Uh, this has been a, a mix of both uh, sectoral specific issues and outside issues, largely weak macroeconomic environment, liquidity crisis, NBFC crisis, uh, leading to dry up of liquidity, along with some sector specific issues like in wind, there is a transition of feed in tariff to auction based mechanism in FY18 that led to two years of uh, low capacity additions and FY20 was bad equally for solar and wind on account of uh, this AP related issues, this PPA renegotiation, which dented the investor confidence to a significant extent. Uh, this is just a, a depiction of how events have developed in the last two months uh, with uh, COVID. Uh, reaching India uh, with first case reported on January 30th, 2020. Uh, this led to government taking several measures, uh, including complete lockdown effective from March 24th, which impacted uh, the, dem the demand side. Uh, a lot of industrial and commercial activities were halted, uh, leading to uh, discoms facing uh, cash flow issues. This led to uh, many states curtailing to uh, uh, back down of power in renewable energy and various notices were also issued by various discoms wherein they stated that they would not be able to pay uh, the re renewable energy generators till further notice and they tried to invoke force major clause under the ppas as well however our government has uh, come up with necessary support uh, as ajay sir also pointed out uh, electricity was categorized as essential service so basically there was minimal impact on the generation side 
Uh, MNRE also came out with timely clarifications uh, providing uh, insistence on must run status for renewable energy projects and uh, focus on regular payments to be made to RE generators, uh, not to do any curtailments and on the construction side, basically giving necessary extensions of a blanket extension of 70 days, which has provided some breather into the sector. Now, the second part of the presentation, I'll just try to cover what have been our learnings, what we have seen so far, what has happened in renewable energy sectors on the project specific issues. First, I'll take on to the operational project side. Uh, we have tried to divide it into three parts, generation, ONM and receivables. On generation side, again, there are three parts uh, here. So first is basically utility, uh, ground mounted projects and wind projects. Uh, where so far there is no major impact on the generation side. However, we have seen curtailments in one or two states during initial period of lockdown. But after MNRE intervention, that thing has subsided. On second aspect is CNI utility projects. There also generation has largely been okay. Uh, there CNI players are trying to uh, use the diversification benefits if they are supplying power within same states to sell to those customers where there is an uptick in power demand, including pharma companies, IT research centers, data centers, which are largely neutral to such events. In terms of third category, which are rooftop, I think those projects are the most impacted power projects where they are supplying power to single industrial or commercial off taker and there is no net metering. So there we have seen shutdown of the plants from lockdown till date. So here the situation is looking slightly uh, bad. In terms of ONM, uh, we uh, in care rated portfolio, we have not seen any issue so far. Uh, many developers have devised strategies uh, to provide continuation of power plants. Uh, on receivable fronts, it actually has been a positive surprise so far. Uh, though many state discoms came out with such orders that they'll not be able to pay because of weak cash flow situation, the actual track record has been uh, good uh, with majority of the discoms paying, which I'll be covering in the next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, CNI space also, I think the collection uh, is uh, okay for our care rated portfolio. Though the collection for the rooftop projects is again impacted because these offices are not getting operation under the lockdown. This slide just covers uh, what has been the trend of all the major central and state utilities. As you can see that majority of the discoms have made payments during the lockdown. Uh, majority of the uh, discoms have also, also made payments in the month of April 2020 as well, which actually is a very good scenario for these players. Uh, the exceptions being AP and Rajasthan discoms, which have not paid during the lockdown period. Now the second category of the renewable projects are under construction projects. Uh, these are impacted uh, under the lockdown. There is no, there was no construction activity which was allowed. Uh, however, as per the MHA order uh, from April 20th onwards, uh, the construction have been started in renewable energy projects, but minimum traction has been seen so far uh, because of these two issues, largely equipment supply disruption and labor mobilization. So. Equipment supply basically the sector was facing the problem since November December 2019 as a majority of the supplies come from China. So China COVID impact was seen in November 2018 their production halted from December 2019 and basically there were no deliveries from China for three months of FY20 November December January and February. Further India started their lockdown in the month of March and uh, this disruption has continued till now. There have been pressures on the supply chains. Even if modules are at the port, there are no way to uh, make the modules reach to the plant locations and uh, thereby, you know, a lot of logistical challenges being faced by the companies. The third major factor uh, is labor mobilization uh, as under construction projects are highly dependent on unskilled labors. So these labors have moved on to their hometowns and uh, thereby remobilization of labors will be very slow and may take time to restore. Uh, this is just depicting an initial view on the impact of credit profile. Uh, largely in the care rated portfolio, what we have seen is in terms of liquidity, 
people have showed up their liquidity a uh, few promoters have showed up their liquidity to take care of any mismatches for next three to six months uh, spvs have individual desras ranging from one to two quarters along with working capital lines which will help them to uh, face the liquidity problems if any discoms don't pay on the debt servicing side uh, given the track record of the discoms majority of the ipps have not availed moratorium however going forward again continuous receipt of payments would be crucial as because a majority half of the debt has also been taken under capital market instruments so there because there is no moratorium availability continuous receipt of payments would be crucial in terms of capex we might see some cost overruns uh, one is universal reason uh, inr depreciation which may lead to increase in module cost and the second would be project specific wherein projects would have drawn down significant amount of debt but the construction activity would have been halted leading to increase in idcs now as uh, ajay sir also covered in his address uh, this covid related situation is expected to continue for some more time so uh, when this will end uh, nobody is sure about that so uh, in the short term we as a rating agency also will be continuously monitoring the situation as uh, these things evolve how everybody reacts to the situations uh, in terms of government support we believe that the government support will be continued but various state government and state discoms may behave in a different manner given the uh, situation seriousness in terms of payment pattern we believe uh, erratic payment pattern to increase and promoters may have to come in to support the spvs uh, in terms of capacity addition fy21 is again expected to be a subdued year with no major capacity expansions uh, given how the situation has evolved so far in terms of financial closure also we feel that there could be challenges as new projects uh, there will be difficulties in finding uh, debt investors in terms of demand pickup if the demand does not pick Uh, we are approaching high wind season uh, from july august onwards so if demand doesn't pick up we might see some more uh, back out of power uh, by various discoms in terms of extensions which mnre has granted in terms of blanket extension we feel these extensions are not enough because most of the projects will see a delay of 4 to 6 months given the factors explained so some more support in terms of extensions would need to be provided for the under construction projects uh with this i complete my presentation uh over to you swati ma'am thank you thank you kunal uh, i think uh, ajay's presentation uh, opening remarks and kunal i think we 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 covered a lot right from global markets to the indian markets and to the sector specific challenges i think we should move into the phase 2 uh, which is the panel discussion of our webinar uh before we start that uh, again let me remind our esteemed viewers that uh, you could we have a q and a session towards the end of it and uh, i would urge uh, everyone to take advantage of this uh, high powered panel here and uh, please type in your questions and uh, we will uh, take them towards the end of it we have budgeted about 15 odd minutes for that uh since you are still with us right yes i am there yeah. can okay. only so <clears throat> so uh, unfortunately i think we've not been able to fix your camera issue yet yeah. so yeah right um, nevertheless uh, uh, i'll start with ranjit first please uh, ranjit you've been a you represent a utility player right and uh, one of the larger ones backed by an international uh, uh, sovereign fund and uh, and of course you have one of the uh, institutions also there on the panel which i believe is one of the investors there uh, you, you've heard our views also what what would be your opening comments on it and uh, how would you see the challenges uh, clearly it, it appears that the renewable energy sector is slightly better placed off is that uh, is that also the ground reality from your perspective because the according to kunal the discom seem to be paying and uh, you know there's still generation happening and there's a must run status um, do you concur or or, or let's, let's hear your views thanks uh, thanks vati i uh, you know uh, Thanks for having me on the panel, and uh, you know, it's uh, good to uh, see the panelists and hear the remarks from Ajay and Kunal. So, you know, between Ajay and Kunal, I think they have covered almost 
everything that uh, was to cover as far as the impact on the renewable energy sector is concerned. Then I can get into more details as the thing progresses, as the questions come in. But the overall, I would tend to agree with the, with their uh, with their version. I think uh, from the perspective of the returns to the shareholders this year, the returns are, are definitely going to be impacted because of uh, you know cost overruns, because of the fact that uh, we might not be able to construct the projects that we are supposed to be constructing this. Uh, this uh, fiscal, they might be delayed up to three, four, five months, depending upon the situation, which will add uh, you know, our, uh, our uh, GNA cost, add to our GNA cost. As far as the industry itself is concerned, I think compared to many of the other industries, we are in a very, very good, uh, good place so far. First two months, we are in a very good place. You know, we are, we don't have any stress on on repayments. We don't have any stress on uh, you know making sure that our people get paid. Our uh, ONM gets done, so those kind of uh, you know liquidity stress or, or cash stress doesn't exist for us. We don't see it uh, happening uh, at this point in time. That could very quickly change if the distribution companies stop paying us. But at the moment, we don't uh, we don't see that uh, we don't see that impact. But you know the, the the return to the shareholders, which is what comes after we pay all the salaries, after we pay all the GNA, after we pay all our lenders. That will certainly be uh, compressed to some extent. Okay. Um, interesting points. You you brought in the new angle that is the the uh, return to the shareholders, and uh, we'll come to that uh, maybe in the, the subsequent round. Uh, similar questions. I'll just move on to Sanjeev. Uh, you know, Sanjeev, you're from the CNI uh, CNI segment, and obviously some plants would be. I mean, the consumer and the uh, sorry, the commercial and the industrial. Customers uh, may have been switched off, or uh, or, or probably the, the kind of offtake may not have been stabilized, uh, given that they may not uh, you know be have been an offtake. Uh, what would your opening remarks be? How do you see uh, the the challenges of your segments? So uh, Swati, uh, I comment uh, on the CNI segment. You know, we obviously have seen some. Uh, challenges in last one month, particularly from the industries which have been closed down uh, because of the lockdown reasons. And these are the industries which are not able to optic power and therefore some of them have even called for the force major type of situation. But I think the situation is not going to last for very long because ultimately the economy has to restart, the manufacturing has to restart. And clearly we see that uh, our, our customers are going to continue to offtake power from us uh, because in any case we are cheaper source of power for them as compared to the grid grid uh, electricity so if they are manufacturing if they are working then we are there and they will be buying power from us so i don't see much challenge from that perspective uh, but i clearly can see that there will be a continuing uh, continuing some sort of a problem with the distribution companies uh, because their own revenues will be will be facing some headwinds. So that is going to probably impact some of the future growth in the CNI segment also, because the distribution companies may also uh, create uh, hindrances and say like, we don't want the CNI customers to go away from our, from, from our supply area. So there can be challenges. So I think as far as the current operations are concerned, we are, we are quite okay, uh, but the future is going to be dependent on quite a bit of the policy support but from the industry side, we will expect more and more customers to continue to buy uh, solar power because it will reduce their overall purchase cost. And also people will be shifting from a CapEx scenario to a PPA type of a scenario because they will be conserving their capital for using in their base operations. So it's a, I think it's an overall reasonable situation. So, okay. Interesting point. Two things. One, uh, you said that the maybe the cash flows are still not impacted to that extent. And the another point that you brought in is which which is that the discounts might be changing in the strategies. So uh, that's an interesting point. I think uh, we will come back to that. Uh, let me move on to the next uh, uh, panelist of ours, Pratibha. Um, Pratibha, you you've been I mean IFC is both an investor and a long term lender. Uh, both in these spaces of utility and CNI. 
how do you see and what as the lender what are your immediate concerns and do you see uh, as a resultant of that do you see risk premiums going up and and of course like ranjit highlighted uh, the, the equity uh, you know the value what would your views be uh, sure swati uh, good afternoon everyone so yes as a lender i mean we are concerned while as of date we haven't seen the receivable situations worsening but yes the next 4 to 5 months will be crucial to see you know if the payments are received on time or not and if you see uh, spvs operating spvs uh, facing difficulty in meeting our debt service as of now we haven't received you know too many uh, requests for delaying morato uh, uh, for moratoriums etc but uh, we as an organization do consider that these kind of uh, requests might come from clients the other thing i wanted to highlight was in times like these you realize how important it is to go with strong sponsors and those who maintain relatively healthy balance sheets while uh, weaker sponsors who have over leveraged themselves at the holding company level uh, would be affected adversely because uh, not just uh, they may not be able to upstream uh, enough cash flows from the spv level to the hold co level but if there are any debt refinancing coming up at the holding company level in times like these such uh, riskier debt is more difficult to replenish so to your question on uh, do we see debt uh, premiums going up yes we do see that happening and uh, especially also in the financial market we've seen you know mutual funds are nbfcs how they have been battered by the crisis so uh, when debt refinancing comes up for many of these uh, companies there will be challenges and we will see risk premium going up interesting i mean uh, uh, that's again an important point because end of the day we don't we still are stuck for long term uh, funding sources and we'll dwell upon this again uh, you know and this would be very interesting for a lot of our viewers um, who are logged in especially from the financial capital market side uh, i'll come to you ajay uh, you have taken us through the global markets you've taken us through the indian markets i Right. Um, you've also been. I mean, while you you've been here for about a month now, almost less than a month actually with Care. You you've been a hang, banker all through uh, your career. Uh, maybe you you could share that ex- from that experience, uh, and uh, uh, you know you could share your views on. Do you think what more the government needs to do? How the Indian economy could fare out? Uh, you know, in the balance sphere, then what more could RBI and the uh, the other institutions could? Uh, do to address some of these challenges aji you are on mute or we can't hear you uh, my apologies um, uh, I, i i was saying that that's a that's a <clears throat> if, i mean i'll try and be very brief on that uh, on that question you asked me um, clearly um, to my mind at least um, you have a very distinguished panel of experts here so maybe they can add to what i what i say uh, i think infrastructure financing in this country um, has uh, been a challenge uh, for a while um, you know uh, strong sponsors have come in and they have provided a huge amount of uh, both equity and debt support institutions like ifc represented by pratibha uh, and um, number of pension funds cdpq cppib they have built asset portfolios in india they have been more uh, most uh, post active on the operational assets i think the bigger challenge is really projects under construction uh, how to get uh, financing to these institutions uh, post the negative period uh, that infrastructure went through between 2013 and 2018 or 2017 and that is the post uh, the largely the coal fired power plants the gas fired power plants and not renewable energy as uh, per se but um, experience of lenders has been bitter on uh, ppp projects in india for various reasons they have partly themselves to blame they went overboard perhaps they supported uh, weak sponsors as uh, uh, as put up by uh, as just suggested by pratibha uh, over leveraged balance sheets and uh, not tight enough contracts were signed uh, and you know so i think what india needs going forward the, rather than belaboring about the past what india needs going forward is very strong um, sort of government policy around how to allocate risk and responsibility in infrastructure projects going forward um, how do we, how do you allocate um, how do you make sure that ppp doesn't suffer uh, how do you make sure you have strong uh, predictive and stable policy making in the center which again pratibha talked about and then 
um, solid dispute resolution mechanisms, right? We know very legitimate receivables stay uh, stay um, uh, due for payment for not weeks or months, but sometimes years altogether, and that uh, stretches financials of the of the uh, underlying projects uh, for far too long. And how much money can the sponsor keep putting in? Uh, when the IRRs get dislocated with those type of cost overruns. So uh, the answer to your question is not easy, and we'll discuss that and debate that some more. Uh, lastly, on the RBI and uh, other uh, point you made, uh, like I mentioned briefly in my opening comments, I think Reserve Bank of India's job as monetary policy support and credit support institution in the country is limited in these difficult circumstances. RBI can make sure that there is enough liquidity in the system uh, and it can provide um, a, a extraordinary support to the banking system through which they intermediate. Now, uh, for RBI to open its books and start underwriting credit will be very hard. Uh, that is the job of the government. And um, to my mind, uh, the fiscal concessions, fiscal stimulus packages, fiscal guarantees, you name it, and under any head, will have to come from the GOI. Uh, it will not come from Reserve Bank of India. It is not their mandate uh, to underwrite credit risk in the market directly that they write through banks. So uh, to my mind, RBI has done enough, or it, it will continue to do enough in my view. Liquidity is very good. Banks have enough surplus cash, so banks can't say that they don't, don't have money to borrow uh, or they don't have sources to borrow from. Banks have enough money, 8 lakh crores going into Reserve Bank of India LAF auctions on a daily basis and reverse reports. So there is enough money in the system. The question is, where will the risk appetite come from? And how do you ensure that the, um, that the uh, banking system gets back into lending to at least good quality projects uh, back again, as opposed to just giving money at 3.5% to RBI? Very, very important point, uh, Ajay. And I think as a, as a country, we were grappling, really grappling with this issue. How do we get the, how do we address this risk part of it? And just parking money with the, with RBI does not serve anybody. Right. Sure. Okay. Uh, great. So I'll come back to Ranjit now again. Uh, Ranjit, you, you spoke about the, uh, you know, the, the retails getting impacted and uh, also the, the cost of funds and all. And uh, you know, also one of those companies who have, uh, I think you're the only one, if, I, if I'm not wrong, who's won the two gigawatt uh, tender, which was which is linked to the manufacturing facility. So it brings in another linked question that uh, and also that the supply chain of China versus uh, you know supply chains being set up in the rest of the country, in the rest of the uh, world, uh, as also the Make in India program, and obviously this uh, this initiative was part of the Make of in, Make in India. So could you just take us through uh, you know? You know, if, if at one go we are talking about uh, returns expectations being lowered down, at the other hand, to to set up manufacturing facilities and probably the ones in which we are doing, uh, uh, you know, IPPs having a backed with manufacturing, all requires a lot of capital, both debt and equity. Uh, so so how, how does how does the two come together? You, you know, at one hand, at the expectation uh, is going down, yeah. at the other hand, there's a need. How do how do you all get them all together? No, no, so they are two completely, uh, completely different things, right? I mean, uh, return expectations coming down. It's not a return expectation coming down. It's actually the return on operating projects for the year. If you look at a company on an overall basis, you know, we will not be immune to COVID. We might, uh, you know, think that we'll be immune to COVID, but in, in certain, uh, you know, in certain uh, manner, we will certainly be impacted by COVID, like whether it is, like I said, a higher G and or you know, not being able to clean our panels as often. The rooftop folks, I'm sure, you know, may not be able to clean the panels or not take meetings on time because of the fact that uh, in some areas of the containment zones, some project will be shut down. We are just lucky to be in a sector, just like Sanjeev said, where uh, you know, as soon as possible, the government and the off-takers and the private off-takers and the open access off-takers do want us to supply power as quickly as possible. So. Uh, as the conditions get eased out, we will, uh, you know, overall not see an impact on uh, our revenue, which is uh, which is such that we will have to go back for moratorium, etc., etc. But we will certainly see an impact on our returns due to COVID. So that is, uh, you know, that is a completely separate uh, issue. On the uh, on the uh, the China point and the make in India thing, I think the government has done a fabulous job in uh, pushing uh, make in India in, in theory. Right. 
so uh, they came out with the auction where we have participated and uh, we've been awarded uh, 500 megawatts per uh, per uh, per annum of uh, cell and uh, bottling manufacturing. There is a lot that the government can uh, do further. You know, they are thinking about putting in ALMM, which is a, an approved list of modules and, uh, and models. They are also thinking of putting a, a, a basic cluster beauty on import, just like the SDD was uh, or is there at the moment. So there are many policy initiatives of the government to uh, uh, it easier for the uh, companies in India to compete with the big China. And I think it is uh, it's totally uh, possible. At least. We can get to a level where the difference between an imported module and a module manufactured in India is not significant. That will have a huge direct impact. I mean, uh, that is the that is a key metric. Right? I mean, we have to see how much would be the direct impact. If, if there is a if there is a difference of maybe half a cent or one cent when we are importing from China versus buying from India, then the direct impact can easily be passed on to the Indian consumer. Without any, uh, without any uh, problems, and uh, in the meanwhile, we would uh, have the huge benefit of, uh, of uh, you know, using uh, Indian ingenuity, using Indian labor, using Indian uh, ancillaries, using Indian uh, you know capital, and uh, keeping all the you know, keep saving some foreign foreign exchange in the in the market, right? The, so in in fact, in theory, it is uh, it is very good. Uh, like I. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I guess there are some, uh, uh, there are some, uh, perhaps for WTO reasons or whatever, the SDD was only for uh, for two years. I think the government is thinking of uh, of, the, of applying PCD for a longer period of time so that the people who want to invest in, uh, in manufacturing can actually have a longer runway in front of them to be able to actually invest, stabilize, develop a market, get competitive. And then you know the the, the PCD can be reduced after five years, after seven years, after ten years, and uh, you know we can uh, we can build vibrant Indian manufacturing uh, industry. Uh, it's a little bit uh, you know unfortunate that on the manufacturing tender which was uh, which was uh, you know brought out in, with such fanfare by the government last year, things have stalled a little bit. We uh, we we did get our uh, LOA in December, but uh, so far, we haven't heard on uh, of, uh, what's happening on the PPAs, and we haven't uh, signed our manufacturing contract with the government as yet. But we are in touch with Seki and MNRI, and I know that uh, Seki and MNRI are trying their best to clear whatever hurdles um, are there to uh, to get these things signed. And we are hoping that that you know, this will get done sooner than later. So I'm, uh, you know, whether it, we are the ones to do it or somebody else does it, I think that uh, Make in India is possible. And uh, it, it makes sense to uh, to push for it. The government is cognizant that they need to push for it and that they can make it make it successful. We just need to uh, you know, we just need to uh, wait for the right uh, right policy initiatives. Well, great. That's uh, encouraging. And uh, and there is a lot of talk. And and I did happen to hear another webinar in which I I believe the. MNRE is, is looking at a lot of other options and also you know trying to introduce services option as making that as part of the gift city and all. So uh, there is a lot of lot of discussion and fortunately this is one industry which is really uh, proactively working uh, in the interest of the development of the entire sector. Um, coming to you, Sanjeev, uh, you mentioned the, the the issue of the discounts coming in and you know uh, coming uh, in. So uh, the whole success of the rooftop and uh, you know and the and the play that it works out with CNI uh, customers is obviously uh, you know the slightly cheaper one. And if the, the discounts come in and put in a spanner in the whole thing, they could you know that could lead to policy complications. So one, uh, do you really see uh, a changes in the business model going forward? Number two, do you see? Former job actually coming up because um, you know even if the manufacturing ramps up, it will happen in stages. We, we're not sure how many of them actually end up. And thirdly, um, uh, do you see uh, uh, you, you know as as a as a player in this, do you see uh, again your uh, the way you choose your customers? Do you see a change in the way you choose your customers because uh, obviously uh, cash flows come from your customers finally, right? 
so, so, so what would be the real, I mean, if I were to mix them all together, what would be the real changes in business model and the way maybe the PPAs are structured or the way that the DISCOM uh, threat or, or risk is mitigated? Do you, what, what would be your views be on this? So I think it's a it's a very evolving scenario also from the energy transition perspective because if we look from the government perspective also uh, when we talk about a make in India type of a situation we cannot be in a in a in a condition where the industries are paying such where industries are buying such high cost power in the excess of 10 12 cents right in the in the real terms. Uh, so if government wants to really encourage and that is that is what we have been hearing from the minister also again and again is that they want to encourage open access and they want to encourage the industries to buy their power directly which means that there is going to be a situation or there should be a situation that develops where it becomes easier for the industries to buy power directly from the generators whether it comes from renewable or whether it comes from the power exchanges so there is going to be a condition where distribution companies and MNRE and the central government have to work together and open up the markets. Now, if you look at the Electricity Amendment Act, so there are multiple things which are being proposed there. So many of the things will be will be very beneficial to the very beneficial to the entire electricity sector. Some of the things are yet to be addressed in a in a complete manner, including like open access or a prepaid meters, which are going to be the things which will change the basic structure of this industry so these things in my opinion i think the government will continue to open up the market but there is going to be a state versus center conflict given that this is a concurrent subject so there is so we are hopeful about that part coming to your uh, second part in terms of our own business model i think we will we are very careful about the selection of our customers so if you look at our current scenario about the collection I think more than 90% is only 1% of our revenue, one to one and a half percent of our revenue. So which is, which is, I think is a very, very good condition to have. Uh, we are not having any sort of an overdue from the customers. So we are very careful about selecting the customers and we continue to follow the same policy uh, because ultimately whether we do, uh, because we are not clearly not chasing the numbers about we don't want to be having like a thousand megawatt or two thousand megawatt or type of a C&I portfolio even if we do 100 200 megawatt every year we want to be very selective and make sure that these are the customers who are going to pay up so which is a which is an important point from our perspective that the business has to be extremely solid it's not about the scale it's about the quality of the business because that is what is going to sustain us uh, so from a business model perspective, I don't see any change from the selection of our customers perspective and we are completely focused on the collection part because if we if we little bit give a leeway to customers, people will just postpone it because who wants to pay uh, when there is free, free working capital available. So we make sure that we chase our any of the customers who are who are not paying in time. We chase them and make sure that they pay up. So, which is an important element. So, we run it like as a as any other manufacturing industry, not necessarily like a power industry. So, we uh, we make sure that uh, we supply and we collect our money. Uh, so, which is which is the way we work. Not uh, probably we don't leave it to the extent that okay, distribution companies don't have the money and they will pay up at some time. Uh, of course, nobody wants that, but that's the fact of that industry. Right. So, so, so we are saying that you did not offer discounts also. Sorry, we won't offer discounts also. We want discounts. Yeah, yeah, customers are asking for discounts, even our existing customers. But we have clearly told them that this is like a complete project finance transaction. We have budgeted our costs. We know what the tariff looks like. We have shown to the banks what is the DSCR and how much revenue we are going to make. So there is clearly no scope about it. But having said that, some of our very good customers who where we see a repeat business potential, we also are open to having loser credit terms. For example, if their payment terms for like 30 days, we can give them like 90 days in this year. Uh, but clearly because we are not highly leveraged company on, a, on an overall basis, we are still like one is to one on a debt equity basis. Uh, our projects are never leveraged more than 65%. So we keep a lot of buffer in there. 
so we are in a position to absorb some of these risks so these have been part of our deliberate strategy that we keep a uh, one a reasonable debt equity ratio second we keep a very large portfolio of customers across industries so we don't have right. customers from any one particular industry and we make sure that we are not dependent on any one customer so that has come all very useful at this stage sure <clears throat> no no great um i'll come to you pratibha and and maybe um, and it, it's 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 important from to hear that uh, see infrastructure project financing is also and like ajay also mentioned is all about the the contracts and the pps and the and the way the risk has been contained uh and the way the indian markets have behaved to contract honoring and the kind of disputes that we've seen in the recent past on on all these areas especially related to the discounts and the safeguard duties and the pass throughs and all that uh, as as a lender what are your comments on all this how do you see this and how do you see is this worse off in india vis-a-vis some of the other geographies or uh, what, what are your views on this so as a lender of course i mean we want certainty in everything and hence if everyone honors the contracts it's the best thing the best place in the world but we don't understand in times like these that is why you have the force majeure clause in contracts and we will see um, whether we have seen in discounts in india trying to uh, you know invoke that clause or we've seen epc contractors trying to invoke that clause and the situation is not just in india we have seen even across uh, markets in countries like bangladesh and countries like philippines we have seen you know the government authorities telling the consumers that they can take more time to pay it's not just unique to india in countries like pakistan or uh, egypt we have seen uh, like here in india uh, the government encouraging the, them to seek debt uh, deferrals or moratoriums on debt payments so the situation is i mean pandemic has been unfortunately something which was unexpected and hence uh, people are governments are trying to react in a ways to try and uh, solve for the immediate pain and of course going forward what we would expect is people you know all the parties to the contract to return to the normal and uh, you know honor uh, what uh, they had in uh, the first place promised to do fair great uh i think we we before we move into the q and a just one question and since we are a rating agency and finance long term finance and uh, this is is obviously the topic uh this is international um, interest and you know we have indian companies like azure and the others who have done international bonds also uh and we've also seen that somehow our traditional banks have you know we've had more of the nbfcs being more um, you know more important players in funding or the financial institutions being the bigger players over here and then at the same time uh, in terms of the interest of the international investor we've seen a whole lot of uh, sovereign wealth funds and all uh, there has been in the past talk about uh, the bond markets and clearly after the franklin templeton thing we, you know there's a challenge over there uh, what could be the various financing options i mean um, and maybe pratibha j even even for the matter than g we could have want to abuse because you've done a couple of these international bonds right and i'm sure there would be refinancing coming up a couple of years down the line uh, how do you see what could be the innovative structures we experimented in the past with partial credit guarantees enhancements you know it's you know let's just let's just have one by one maybe quickly uh, starting with maybe ranjit you um, you know i think debt is uh, like uh, Sponsors are uh, are supportive and good sponsors. Debt has uh, has never been the issue. We have not faced in my career here in, uh, in India uh, any problems ever on, on raising debt. Uh, you know, whether the debt is raised within India, whether it is raised outside of India, uh, and at any point in time, even today, the liquidity is available for uh, for anyone to raise debt. Of course, the risk premium could go up and down. The the spread could go up and down. So therefore, you. Uh, have uh, more costly or less costly debt, uh, depending on exactly when you draw it down. But overall, for uh, for project debt, uh, you know, we have not faced uh, uh, faced any issues uh, so far. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, anybody else, Pratipa, you, Sanjeev, you would want to come in? Yeah, so I would um, I would add on to that that essentially I don't think there is any challenge for good quality projects. If you're talking of like eight lakh crores being let at three lent at three point five percent, then clearly there is a market at nine ten percent. Uh, but uh, the whole question boils down to what is the risk profiling of these projects uh, at the end of the day. So and these are like project finance projects. So I think the right. ultimate uh, question is about who are the sponsors, how you're building the plants, who are your off takers, as usual, what is your debt equity ratio, what is your DSTR, how comfortable you are with the working capital cycles. Once you put all that and then you feel comfortable, yeah, okay, uh, given little bits of ups and downs, can I survive this project for a duration of 15 years? Because like we are not even talking of like six months, one year, these are like very, very long-term projects. So therefore, you want to make sure that you build in some of these aberrations. Is there an aberration on the foreign exchange side? Is if the if the exchange rates if the exchange rates really go up because right now we may be all willing to pump in the money pump the money into the economy, but if it leads to an inflation, then what happens? Will the interest rates really go up? And if those right. interest rates from the expected nine percent go up to eleven, will the project still be able to service my debt? Because the government is not going to pay for that additional two percent, we've already put in everything on the table. Fair enough. Quickly, comments before we move. Uh, we we ask our, We have quite a few questions already. But the Ajay, have you? So uh, yeah, on uh, this, what I just wanted to supplement what both Sanjeev and Ranjit was saying, that you know earlier when we talked about long-term bonds, there was always this question of the ratings, the state discounts, etc. But now I think there is substantial number of operating portfolio which have higher rated off takers. So the stage is set, and we should see you know long-term bond issuances for the RE sector in India. Right. We also really hope so. Um, yeah, you know, because essentially, while we know this is all tight and sure, yet for some reason or the other, it's you know, it has its it's had its limitations, but we definitely uh, you know wish that. And uh, yeah, uh, any closing comments of yours, Ajay? No, I think I'll, I'll just uh, I, I agree with uh, what has been said by the um, by the two CEOs and Pratiba. Uh, I think the good quality sponsors will continue to uh, get capital. Uh, that is always the case. It's just that. Um, um, in the uh, current current situation is uh, an exceptional one and um, we i still believe that there will be some help that the uh, that the system will require uh, from the government of india uh, to uh, to kick start this economy because uh, once the brakes get applied uh, then it's not sectoral anymore it is uh, economy wide and that's what worries me a little bit uh, as i said in the opening comments but other than that, I agree with uh, with everything that has been said. Sure. Uh, should we uh, we can move to the Q and A now? Um, Ratan, how does it work? Uh, you know, I can see some questions here. Yeah, there will be queries coming in and in the question panel. Do we see any hands uh, raised? Okay, till the time I, I uh, in the panel, I don't really see anything. Can you see in Ritul something? Yeah, it will be the question panel, ma'am. If you click on the question and undock it, there's a small box on the right side. In the panel, ma'am, there will be questions section. Extreme right, there is a small box. We have yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm getting that. In. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure these questions are. How, uh, there's one question I can't, uh, I'm not very sure what it means. It says, how will the logistics be pulled off once the pandemic weakens? I'm not sure what it that means. Is that is the biggest biggest uh, question to be uh, actually answered, which is what we are tackling at the moment. 
especially when so, it comes to self production so uh, you know at the moment uh, uh, there are two challenges that uh, we are facing one is uh, of course that uh, interstate and intra state travel uh, is a very very challenging there is hardly yeah. uh, all districts not being for interstate it's difficult to travel inter district it is impossible to travel in the state so uh, you know that creates a huge amount of challenge for uh, arranging paper secondly uh, you know with, with a lot of uh, fear having been built amongst the migrant uh, labor everybody wants to go back home. and our fear is that if everybody goes back home it will be at least two or three months before they would venture out to uh, come back to work so uh, it is a huge worry that uh, the, though the government has made logistics uh, possible and move material around there is no restriction on moving material but you know there is a huge restriction on moving people we have uh, the renewable energy industry was allowed to start construction on 20th of april and today we are on the 7th of may right it uh, 17 days later almost all the projects on uh, under construction Barely started, uh, barely started, uh, and um, you know, to the extent of a thousand labor, for example, we are currently working with two hundred labor. And just like Vinal uh, had mentioned, that uh, extension that's been given by um, MNRC is a key of seventy days. Even though on paper it is, uh, it, it seems to make sense. You know, forty days the thing was shut, thirty days more than that. But unfortunately, we are fearful that the impact, which you know, that, that thirty days might not be enough. For us to really get back on our feet, as far as uh, construction uh, is concerned, and uh, in the monsoon, down the pond, the wind guys are going to be really, really affected, and even the solar guys are going to be affected with uh, with monsoon around the pond. So we've lost the month of March. Of April, we are losing May, and June onwards we will be hit by monsoon. So June, July, August, part of September. So. So you know, if we could be seeing delays of four to five months instead of just seventy days on our on our project, so logistics is going to be the key challenge for us as we come back on the on the field of construction. So do you see, um, you know, obviously, then that leads to, like you mentioned, that that leads to cost plus. But then on the um, on, on the technology side, do you see certain, you know, or on the business model side, do you see any innovations to kind of kind of see that. Is, Increased cost um, and and probably some kind of increased risk premium, you know, kind of gets absorbed in the whole. Given that the tariffs are where they are, the PPS are getting signed at what they are, or we see an upward revision uh, somewhere like that uh, in terms of um, tiny PPA prices. There are two or three aspects to this, right? One is uh, that uh, you know there are obviously companies. So one aspect is that the delay in SUD and, and the delay in the SUD will prevent at least. Getting hit by liquidity damages by our own labor. That is one aspect of the equation. The second aspect of the equation is: Do our, you know, as, as if, we, if we have material lying on the ground, if people have material lying on the ground in April and March and May, then they will be hit by IDC. They will see an increase in IDC, and uh, and that would be an impact on the project cost, which they will have to uh, will have to suffer. As as you, we were lucky that uh, we have never gone deep into construction. We don't have uh, much material at site, so we haven't drawn up much debt, so we are okay. But uh, some of our uh, our peers might uh, might hurt because of that. Some of this impact might be offset by a drop in uh, in commodity prices and maybe the, maybe a little bit of drop in uh, panel prices. Of course, that doesn't help people who are uh, advanced into construction and have material on the ground already. And therefore, they have already paid for their modules or paid for the steel, and there will be a, a rise in uh, in, uh, in their uh, ICs. And even for people like us, even though we might see a little bit of decrease in the cost, but like uh, was mentioned by Kunal, uh, you know, the cost of the, the, the dollar rupee has moved negatively for us. So, uh, you know, so, so though we might not be impacted by the dollar rupee if we are able to drive down our costs, but overall. Uh, you know, projects will see some projects will see increase in their IDC numbers. Fair enough. There's a question on the for Sanjeev, uh, I, and I maybe it's a little incomplete. 
it says what's the reaction from the CNI clients and I guess maybe they're referring to uh, you know the reductions or, or uh, yeah Sanjeev you may want to take that yes so the reaction from CNI customers about the uh, about the impact of this event uh, COVID is like essentially they all are seeing some reduction in their manufacturing activity so they want a little bit more flexibility in terms of their offtake arrangements that is one part and clearly everybody wants to take advantage uh, to some extent that what what is how they can cut down their costs so they are even coming back and saying okay, how can we reduce our costs and all so but uh, I don't see so much of uh, impact to be honest from the good quality C and I customers. Obviously, some industries are affected more than others. Uh, but given that uh, you work across industries, so the overall impact gets reduced significantly. So I don't see much impact uh, from that from that perspective. That's <clears throat> encouraging. Um, you know, that's encouraging. So. Uh, right. Uh, Rajul, do we see any show of hands and all? Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Sandeep Singh has raised his hand. I'll just unmute him. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Sandeep Singh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So my question is to Sanjeev. Uh, so he already touched upon that, but I my question was what is the overall ag at aggregate level what is the drop in in the you know consumption pattern for example 10 percent 20 percent what yeah, is the okay. aggregate so drop in the consumption if you, the, if you look at the electricity sector overall demand from, as a country as a whole we are clearly seeing a drop of around 25 to 30 percent in the electricity demand during this period and that is largely arising because of the drop in the commercial industrial segment there is some there is some uptick on the residential side but very nominal but the impact of that uh, in the venue terms for the distribution companies is even larger because these are the people who pay even higher tariffs so there is a overall drop in the in the electricity demand and probably that will continue for some time so you will see a will see the impact of that on annual numbers also Okay, so 25 30 percent is as you're saying is a reasonable number. That, that's as a, as that's a, a grid number, that's a, that's a grid number, that's not our number, it's like the entire electricity grid of India. Okay, thank you so much. Understood. I think there's another raised hand from Mr. Prashant Jain. Mr. Prashant Jain, if you could go ahead and uh, put your query. So, my question is for Ms. Pratibha. Uh, is there any funding mode for the equity contribution, uh, say, for initial few years of the projects, which can be uh, repaid by the quest sweep mechanism? Uh, so from IFC side, we have launched our COVID facility. It's a US dollar, $2 billion, uh, $2 billion for our clients worldwide. However, for the first phase of the facility, it, it is available only for our existing clients. Uh, we are expecting to launch another facility which will be available for others. And yes, this will cater to short term needs, especially to mitigate the impact of COVID on uh, companies in all sectors. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Jain. Rupee, rupee is continuously depreciating. So, for the solar projects, since uh, inverters and modules are the important uh, important segment, so how can we reduce the uh, rupee depreciation impact on the project cost? Is there any specific or specialized uh, structure which we can implement so we will be benefited from? I think Ranjit, you could, you could, I, I think Ranjit's already answered that, but maybe you could elaborate a little more for the benefit of the gentleman. You're asking me, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, saying, I, I'm saying if you could take that question. This so is about, my question uh, is, 
Okay, sorry. Your question is to Pratibha only. Sorry, Pratibha, you please. Anyone, sorry, anyone, anyone, Ranjit, Pratibha, anyone can answer. Yeah, so from IFC side, I don't think we do have a facility for these kind of issues. I mean, maybe Ranjit can explain, you know, what Azure is doing uh, to mitigate this risk. So this is basically the dollar rupee thing, right? So actually, uh, you know, we were very conservative and we were uh, lucky to the extent that whatever modules we needed over the next eight or nine months till almost the end of this year, we had already hedged. Uh, you know, our rupee dollar, uh, uh, our exposure in the months of December, January. So uh, we are actually sitting pretty in the sense that we are not going to be impacted by this uh, rupee dollar uh, variation. But yes, for projects that were paid last year but are going to be commissioned only next year, we are certainly uh, going to be impacted for projects which are coming up next year. But like I said during my uh, comments earlier, that we are also seeing on the other side a reduction in the commodity pricing and we are also seeing a reduction in the module pricing over the last two, three, four weeks. So hopefully, uh, you know, the projects that have been paid out last year or being paid in the beginning of this year, before the rupee started to tank, will not be affected because of the fact that, you know, the rupee dollar movement will be offset by the drop in commodity. And Do we have time for more, or, or I think uh, we've already at I, 5 I, I, now, I think so. we can take a last query. Uh, I'll it's coming from the line of Mr. Jitendra Singh. Okay. Yes. Mr. No, Jitain. I can't unmute him. Uh, I think that was the last question taken up, ma'am. Then you can take it. So we're running short of time. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I think with this, uh, Ajay, would you like to give the closing uh, comments in? Yes, sure. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, want to now not keep the panelists and the guests longer. I uh, want to uh, thank the, um, uh, our esteemed guests uh, this afternoon uh, for having um, come on the panel for spending their time uh, and giving and sharing their perspectives on this uh, this very important sector, which is uh, not just a, a priority for some or for private sector. It's a huge priority for the government of India and for state governments to to continue to promote renewable energy in in India. And it's also a huge pri uh, sort of priority for care, as uh, we are a formidable force in the sector and continue to follow the sector on a very frequent basis. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Gupta, Ranjit Gupta, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sanjeev, and um, and Pratibha uh, for having spared the time uh, this afternoon and be with, been with us uh, and also um, sort of um, continue to have a very active and vibrant relationship uh, with CARE. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. Lord. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for sparing this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you.